Who, me? Yeah, you little motherfucking crab ass punk. Crab is a disrespectful term used by bloods against Crips, defacing the enemy. For the first time, I noticed her, a girl. Looking up, I brought her into focus. Never seen her in my life. You a lie, bitch, I blurted out and was abruptly cut short by a police boot on the back of my neck. Shut up, asshole. Are you sure this is the shooter, man? Yes, yes, I'm sure, officer. He was trying to talk to me and then found out who I was with and just pulled a gun and started shooting. I just, bitch, you lying. I don't know you. I was, uh. I was kicked in the side by the police officer who had already smashed my face to the ground. One more word, dipshit, and you'll get another ass whooping. I felt it best to remain silent. I was transported to the 77th Street Division and booked for attempted murder. Now, I was hoping he wouldn't die. I was the only one arrested. At the station, I was asked a series of questions, of which I answered none. I was taken to Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall to await court. I was no doubt facing a camp term now, worse than Juvenile Hall for the attempted murder, which I hadn't even had nothing to do with. The strict code of street held me though, and I said not a word to anyone about who really had shot the blood. The hall, juvenile hall, was another territory to conquer, just like South Central. But all the sets were now face to face, bunched together in units of 50. I met Crips who I had heard about and others whose names I had seen spray painted on walls. I fought against bloods whose sets I had heard of and, of course, against those who were our worst enemies. I went to trial three months later. The gang turnout was surprising. Along with my family, at least 15 of my homeboys came. All were in full gear, gear is gang clothes, colors and hats, actually uniforms. On the other side, the Bloods also came in force, in full gear. Tension ran thick through the courtroom as stares of hate were passed back and forth. I was told after the first day that a shoving and shouting match had taken place in the hallway outside the courtroom. My homeboys had to serve as bodyguards for my family. On my next court date, I was released into the custody of my mother, pending trial proceedings. During my next scheduled court date, three gangs filled the court, the Crips, the Bloods, and the LAPD crash unit, community resources against street hoodlums. The atmosphere was tight with rage that ran just below the surface, and this is where I began to grasp the meaning of low intensity warfare. I couldn't believe how personally the Bloods were taking this. After all, their homie was shot, legally, that is, within the unspoken but generally known guidelines of gang warfare. He was fired on in a free fire zone. In fact, this area, as I explained above, was contested. We had gotten numerous reports of blood sightings. He just happened to be the first cut. And now here we were, taking the war off the streets and into the courtroom, where neither of us had the experience to win. Blood after blood testified to my shooting of their homeboy, all lying, of course. The final witness was the victim himself. He was thin and wearing cornrow braids. His would be the testimony to seal my fate. After the prosecution asked him to convey the events of that day and time, he was asked if he saw the person who had shot him in the courtroom. Silence, and then, no, he ain't the one who shot me. What? The DA couldn't believe his ears. Murmurs filled the courtroom and his homies whispered their disbelief at his dishonesty. Murmurs filled the courtroom as his homies whispered their disbelief at his honesty. Snickers and taunts came from our side. I sat still and just looked at Mike, who stared back without a semblance of hate, but with a sort of remorse for having put me through this. The judge's gavel struck wood, case dismissed. I stood still looking at Mike, who was dismounting the witness stand. Tell track, Mike whispered as he passed me, that I'll see him at another time. I said nothing, turned, and fell into step with my crew. That night, I led an initiation party into family hood and dropped two bodies. No one was captured. My relationship with my mother soured continuously as I was drawn deeper and deeper into the streets and further away from home and school. My sixth grade graduation was my first and last. Actually, it was the last time I ever seriously attended school for academic purposes. My homeboys became my family. The older ones were father figures. Each time I shot someone, each time I put another gun on the set, 
Each time I successfully recruited a combat soldier, I was congratulated by my older homeboys. Every gang member is responsible for bringing guns into the game. We used to break into neighborhood homes and steal their weapons. Now, with the influx of narcotics and overseas connections, guns are bought by the crate. When I went home, I was cursed for not emptying the trash. Trash? Didn't mom know who I was? Apparently not. D and I continued to campaign hard, but we couldn't transcend that first stage of reputation. Today, it's twice as hard to break through because there are so many competing factors. The blood and crypt communities have grown to astronomical proportions since the 70s. The police have a vast array of laws and techniques to curtail the bangers' growth. And, of course, there are narcotics. Everyone wants to be rich and no one wants to go to war. On February 14, 1979, when I was 15, I was captured for assault and auto theft. I took a car from a man by striking him over the head. Too drunk to drive, I hit every car on the block in my attempt to flee the area. The last and final car I struck was the Cadillac. Once I slammed into the rear of the Cadillac, the bumpers must have gotten caught because the car I was in would not go into reverse. As I exited the vehicle, I was surprised to find practically the whole block chasing me. Actually, it turned out to be just the owners of the cars I had hit. I'm certain the chase closely resembled a lynch mob in pursuit because the chasers had sticks and baseball bats and were initially all running together in a tightly held group. But as I began to accelerate out of fear and youthful energy, their group dwindled to two. Both men were quite intent on catching me. I continued to run, however, at top speed. Falling farther and farther behind, they cursed me and swore my death upon capture. I struggled on. Luckily, I had taken the vehicle not far from home. I lived on 69th Street, and I had taken the car on 66th. Therefore, my run was not that far. Rounding the corner onto my block, I was elated to see that my pursuers were at least four houses behind me. I darted down the drive of our next door neighbor and hopped the fence into our backyard. Then I staggered heavily into the house and literally collapsed on my mother's bed. Pulling myself up, I began to discard my clothing, putting on fresh pants, socks, and sneakers. I deliberately omitted a shirt so as to look as at home as possible, just in case. Not 10 minutes later, I heard the police helicopter hoovering above the house. I felt good at least to know that my mother was, as usual, at work. Five minutes after I heard the first hum of the helicopter, I heard voices coming from the front room. I quickly hid myself in my mother's closet to no avail. I was violently pulled from the closet and promptly arrested. I later found out that it was a mentally ill cat named Theopolis who had snitched me off to my pursuers, who in turn summoned the police. During the trial on assault and grand theft auto charges, my sister Candice perjured herself to save me from a jail term, but was not convincing enough against 13 witnesses who had originally given chase. I was subsequently convicted and sent to nine months in camp. Camp is the third testing ground in a series of tests to register one's ability to stand firm. The streets, of course, being the first and juvenile hall the second. With each successive level, the hall, camp, youth authority, prison comes longer, harder time. This, coupled with a greater danger of becoming a victim, pits one hard against the total warrior mentality of do or die. Here, the slogan ends and reality sets in. Nine months later, I was released from Camp Munns and dropped off in the initial stages of a war that would forever change the politics of cripping and the internal gang relations in South Central. Although my camp term lent prestige to my name, it did little to help me break through to the desperately sought after second level of recognition. Crazy D I learned was due out in December. So I just did odd jobs, wrote on walls, i.e. advertised, collected guns and maintained visibility. It was during my stay in camp that my younger brother chose to follow me into gang banging and then ally himself with the A trays. 79 was the year of the littles, that is the year of the third generation of A tray gangsters. All those who were of the second resurrection beginning in 1975 and ending in 1977 acquired little homies bearing their names. For example, there was Little Monster, 
Little Crazy D, Little Spike, etc. In a nine month period, the set doubled. Meanwhile, the war between us and the Rolling Sixties was beginning to heat up. The first casualty was on their side. Tyrone, the brother of an OG 60, was gunned down during a routine fist fight by a new recruit calling himself Dog. The OG whose brother had been killed wanted us to produce the shooter before a full scale war broke out. The shooter, who few of us knew as he was new, immediately went into hiding. We thus could not produce him and our relationship with the 60s soured dramatically. Up until that point, only one of our homies had been killed and his death was attributed to the Inglewood families. Threats of revenge grew loud, as did rumors of an intimate war. In the midst of these warnings, our homeboy Lucky was ambushed on his porch and shot six times in the face. Witnesses reported seeing a man in a brown jogging suit flee the area immediately after shots rang out. The night Lucky was murdered, Mumphy, a member of the 60s, was seen at Rosecrans skating rink in a brown jogging suit. It had been further noted that Mumphy had been heard telling Lucky that since one of my homeboys died, one of yours is gonna die. A fight had ensued and had subsequently been broken up by members of both sides. After Lucky's death, tensions ran higher in our hood. We wanted the shooters to fall under the weight of our wrath. A meeting of both sets was called by the OGs in an all out last effort to curtail a war, which would no doubt have grave consequences. The most damaging thing that we all held in mind was that we all knew where one another stayed. Not more than six months before we had been best friends. The meeting was a dismal failure. It erupted into an all-out gang fight reminiscent of the old gang rumbles. Diplomatic ties were thus broken and war was ceremoniously declared. Another casualty quickly accrued to their side as their homeboy Pimp was ambushed and killed. Several others were wounded. At about that time, Dre was released. I relayed to him the drastic chain of events of recent times and we both chose to give 100% to the war effort. And perhaps we concur. This is the issue to carry us both over the second realm of recognition on our climb to OG status. In retaliation for Pimp's death, with the 60s without a doubt attributed to us, our homie Tic Tac was shot. And while he lay in the street mortally wounded, the gunman came back around the corner in a white van. Before we could retrieve Tic Tac, they ran his head over and continued on. The occupants in the van had also shot two other people before shooting and killing Tic Tac, though both were civilians. This was the second homie to die in a matter of months. Shit was getting major. Although we had been engaged in a war with the families, it had always somehow been contained to fistfights and flesh wounds, with the exception of Shannon, who, we contend to this day, died at the hands of the families. This escalation was new and actually quite alarming, for Crips tend to display a vicious knack for violence against other Crips, as will be duly noted in the following chapters. Seemingly, every Crip set erupted in savage wars, one against the other, culminating into a Beirut-type atmosphere in South Central today. The news catching the news catching items of violence to date are a resulting of clashes between Crips and Crips and not, as the media suggests, red and blue. Crip and blood. Once bodies began to drop, people who were less than serious about banging began to fall by the wayside. Excuses of having to be home by dark and to having to go out of town abounded. The set thus dwindled to, I would learn, fighting shape. D and I held fast and seized the time. China, a very pretty but slightly plump girl, became my steady girl. She and I would often dress alike to further prompt our union. China lent me her 8-track tape player. One afternoon, as D and I were walking with China's radio, we drew fire from a passing car, no doubt 60s. Unscathed but very angry, D and I climbed from the bushes. Check this out. D spoke with barely controllable anger. Cody, we gotta put a stop to these motherfuckers shooting at us and shit. Looking at me hard in search of some signs of overstanding and compliance, I said, you right, homie, I'm with it. 
You serious? D gave me a sinister smile. All right then, he continued. Let's make a pact right now to never stop until we have killed all of our enemies. This means whenever we catch him, it's on. All right, I'm serious, D. I said as I pledged my life to the 60s, total destruction or mine, whichever came first. With that, I spun it through China's radio high into the air as an all out gesture of total abandonment. The radio seemed to tumble in slow motion, twisting and twirling as my gang life up until that time flashed in vivid episodes across my mental screen. From graduation to this, blam, the radio hit the ground, shattered into a hundred pieces and the screen in my mind went blank. There was D with his hand extended. I reached, grabbed and shook it with vigor. From that point on, the medium of exchange in my life has been gunfire.